Hello, Lightbox 2021. Uh, welcome back to the Noman live stream. Uh, I'm your host, Adam Hartel, and it is my pleasure to be able to host some fantastic artists today for our character design sketch session as a part of Lightbox Online this year. Um, Lightbox has been amazing so far this week, um, and I'm sure that many of you tuning in are have been a part of Lightbox. If you're not familiar with Lightbox, you've got to head over to lightboxexpo.com check it out. It's literally only $2 to, uh, to get a ticket to this online event and some of the best artists in the world and a massive community of artists from all different kinds of disciplines are a part of this. It's amazing talks, interviews, and also some really cool jam sessions, which is what we're doing today. Uh, the Noman School, which you just saw a reel of our campus and kind of what we're doing here in Hollywood, training artists for careers uh, in visual effects, animation, um, and, uh, and film. Uh, we are very, very proud to be partnering with Lightbox this year and hosting uh, some of these fantastic art jams. And if any of you are in need of closed caption um, for the stream, you can head over to our uh, Facebook platform that we're streaming on. Just look up Nomon, that's G-N-O-M-O-N on Facebook, and look for our live feed and you can have the option there for closed captioning for the stream. All right, so without any further ado, I would like to introduce some of the absolutely amazing artists that we have with us today. Uh, and first, I'd like to introduce uh, uh, Nikolai uh, Lokertsen, who is going to... Uh, Nikolai... Oh, you have your camera on. Fantastic. Awesome. <laughs> it's great. To, I mean, just I had a window in front of you. I get you get that out of the way. Great to see you, sir. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for uh, having me here. Yeah, it's, uh, and, uh, it's an honor. A fun fact, you are streaming to us from Norway, correct? Yes. That's very, right. very cool. Yeah, Nik Nikolai and I were chatting a, a bit about uh, my having the opportunity to live in Norway for a while, and a fantastic country it is. Uh, so great to have you with us. Um, next up, I'd like to introduce um, Kristen Garland. Bring Kristen's webcam up on the screen here. Oh, here we go. There you are. <laughs> Hi, Kristen. Hi. Welcome. <laughs> Welcome to uh, to the stream. It's going to be awesome drawing together today. Um, and uh, yeah, a couple of uh, interesting points of information about you. I know that you worked with uh, Bobby Chu on Nico and the Sword of Light. Is that correct? Yes. That was awesome. uh, my first gig in television animation. So yeah, and you and you've worked on another um, project with Netflix. Is that right? Yeah, I'm currently on a show called My Dad, the Bounty Hunter, and Everett Downing and Patrick Hartman are our uh, showrunners. So really great. Very stuff. very cool, awesome. All right, our next uh, artist that I'd like to introduce is Kofi Ofusu, uh, coming to us from. Uh, hey, Kofi, welcome. Hello, guys. Mm -hmm. Thank Good you for to have you with us. Hello. Yeah, and I believe you are in Ghana. Is that correct? Exactly. That's correct. So cool. Accra. Awesome. Um, yeah, one of the things I absolutely love about Lightbox is just how all of us from every corner of the planet are getting connected with each other and uh, getting to play together. So very, very cool. Um, and you are also a character designer as well. Exactly, yes. Excellent. Um, and then uh, our next artist is, uh, and I'm going to try to pronounce it correctly in Dutch, Walter Tulp, coming to us from yes. Holland. Hello, yes. so did I get it right? Yes, you got it <laughs> Was right. Was it close? OK, yes. cool. Yeah, I had, <laughs> yeah, you know, I had the pleasure me. of, absolutely, I had the pleasure of living in Holland for a while. And so I did did my best to give my Dutch pronunciation of your name. Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thank you, Bill. Um, so uh, yeah, you're working in uh, feature animation as a character that's designer, for, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Awesome. Very, very cool. And where in the Netherlands are you again? I'm in a place, a little town called Osterbeek, which is close to Arnhem, which is close to the German border. Yeah, you're way, you're way over on the east side. Osterbeek, yeah, I've been to well, Arnhem quite a you, bit. If you trip and fall, you're in another country. That's how small this country is. So. <laughs> That's a great way to say it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, thank you very much for joining us. Absolutely. And our final artist I would like to introduce is Sylvain Marc, coming to us from France. Hello, Hello. welcome. Hello, yeah, it's wonderful to, to see you. And uh, I'm just going to, uh, sorry, I have to minimize a window here. I'm doing a little bit of juggling. There, now I can see you. <laughs> Hello, Sylvain. Hey. Um, hey there. And um, yeah, so we've got kind of the Brady Bunch cameras up on the screen now. And uh, we will <laughs> put the screen share of Magma up on the screen. And I think you guys have been warming up in there. There we go. And I'll just take, I'll take off um, 
my webcam so that we can make more room for you guys. Awesome. OK, so today is our uh, character design drawing jam. And um, we can approach this a few different ways, guys. Um, I know that some artists love the sort of blank open canvas and are just ready to do anything. Other artists like more a little bit more structure, like a little bit of direction. So um, I have a few thoughts on prompts if anybody is interested. Um, but if you already have an idea of something you want to do, I would just say go for it. But anybody interested in a prompt? Yeah, sure. Yeah, All right, cool. Yeah. So yeah. All right, cool. So I figured I was I, I was thinking of um, where is it here? I was thinking of some some of the sort of typical character tropes, and I thought each person who wants to can take a different character um, who are part of the same story or part of the same world. So for example, you've got you've got your hero, you've got your villain, of course, but then you also you've got your wise mentor, right? And you've another one of the tropes is you've got your trickster or something like that. So um, I thought if, um, and I'll let you guys fight, fight over who takes what, or maybe <laughs> you guys, everybody wants to do a villain or a hero. And we just have a few different villains or heroes on the screen. But I thought if each person takes one and announces what type of character in our story they're making, um, then you start working on your character, but you also keep an eye on. So like if you have, if you have a hero, you're also watching what the person or persons who are making villains are doing, and you need to kind of riff off of what they're doing to make sure your hero can stand toe to toe with them. Uh, that was my thought. So does that sound fun? Yeah, it sounds great. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, do you guys want a? Do you want like a genre or a setting, or do you want to kind of let that sort of serendipitous, serendipitously evolve as you guys start working on your characters? Well, maybe a, some sort of theme uh, or a theme or pushing a direction, maybe. Yeah, we could do like super teams. We could do like superheroes and supervillains, um, or we could go. Uh, here's a few genres for you. We could do we could do superheroes and villains. We could do fantasy, um, or we could do let's say uh, sci-fi. I'd say fantasy, but I don't know. No, I like fantasy. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Two of us. Everybody down with fantasy? Yeah. Yeah, All right. Sure. You guys just want to split up on heroes and villains, or you can also like. I suppose you can decide what si what what team they're on, and you can decide whether they're like you know the young hero or the old wise mentor. I'll let you guys uh, take your freedoms there. All right. Cool. So, first question: Who are our villains? I'll, I'll do a villain. All right. Kristen's taking a villain. Yes. <laughs> I'll, take, uh, I'll take a wise mentor. Sweet. All right. Well, I will. I'm. I will just let you guys go for it because I think it's going to start to become clear what each person is doing, and just kind of choose a part of the canvas. And I really don't think it matters where you are because it'd be kind of cool if the different characters wind up sort of mixed up. Um, and you can uh, even make them interact with each other if you wish. Can I make like a like a medicine man or something like that? Oh heck yeah! Yeah. Is this medicine man going to be like kind of uh, supporting the good guys? Or are they going to be straight up on the uh, villains team, or are they going to be kind of ambivalent? Do we sort of have a a Loki on our hands? Yeah, maybe maybe he's uh, you know whoever has the the gold nuggets uh, for him, you know, like whatever he needs. Maybe he maybe he's not good or bad. It's just yeah, yeah. He's kind of like, hey, if you've got the cash, I'm for hire. Yeah. It's very chaotic, yeah. chaotic neutral. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Oh, we, do we have some D and D players in here? <laughs> I dabble. I dabble. <laughs> and one of the things I love about these sessions is just how it just starts to evolve. It's almost like watching a garden grow. Um, and then you've got everybody's different styles kind of sort of like finding their way into each other on the canvas. Yeah, well, that's the cool thing, just to see how people start, you know. So for everybody's record, uh, Magma 
I don't, I'm not so familiar with it, so <laughs> I'm discovering it as I go. Yeah, it's kind of similar to Photoshop, but it's what I like. I'm I'm using the iPad, and it also has the two two finger undo. If you're used to Procreate, it's also kind mm -hmm. of easy. So that's. Uh, that's one of the things I really like about Procreate is it's very there's like very little clutter on the screen when you're drawing. And if you learn all the little yeah. gestures you can do with tapping and stuff with your fingers, it's actually you can do quite a bit. Yeah, it's uh, also, if, especially if you use the quick menu as well, if you set that up, mm -hmm. I have my uh, like a few favorite brushes and uh, uh, you know, flip canvas horizontally, switch between eraser and brush. And so it, you know, you, it's only when you're switching layers that you really need to go into a menu almost or mm -hmm. brushes. Yeah. yeah, another artist who's been using the iPad quite extensively is uh, Efen uh, Amundsen in Norway. Yeah. Yeah, he's been doing some amazing illustrations on the iPad. Yeah, yeah. fellow Norwegian. Mm -hmm. All right, so yeah, it looks like uh, Walter's getting the wise mentor up and running. I'm gonna kind of take a little tour of our canvas here. There we go, let's do this. I'm trying to zoom out a little bit so I can fit the whole canvas above you guys. All right. Let's see. And Kofi, who are who are what kind of character have you chosen? Um, I'm trying to draw a hero character. Mm -hmm. Who'll be understudying the the wise wizard? Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> kind of a Luke a Luke Skywalker to to Doctor's Obi Wan. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Very cool. No, this is I'm I'm not doing the Obi Wan. I'm oh, which doing, which one did you pick? Um, well, I I don't know if the, the it was mentioned already, but this is like the the uh, good guy who discovers he has superpowers but he oh, is cool he doesn't have them under control yet excellent nice and then nikolai we've got the the medicine medicine man medicine evolving man. over here and i uh, kristen you you picked a villain correct mm -hmm. can you tell us a little bit about what's sort of formed in your mind about your villain so far yeah yeah i'm going with the concept of an iron king a uh, desolate uh, famine induced kingdom everyone hates him but he's that just makes him close his fist tighter and tighter mm. his tyranny mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> okay you thought I, this through <laughs> yeah, yeah I was like making up little stories when I'm drawing awesome. <laughs> Like oh, maybe he was beheaded that. once, and that's why I'm giving him like this cool neck piece. Oh, cool. And then, um, any of you in the chat on the Twitch, Facebook, or YouTube platforms, um, I'll be doing my best to monitor the chat so you guys can feel free to chime in. Um, if you have any questions for our artists, um, please, please feel free to type into the chat and, um, yeah, I'll do my best to try to get to as much of that as I can during the stream. Awesome. We're already getting love for the wizard <laughs> from the chat. <laughs> All right. <laughs> it looks like a nice uh, Gandalf. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, classic. Um, now we've got a question that just came in from the chat for anybody who wants to take it. And that is, how do you go about practicing posing for character design? Posing? Yeah. Sorry. Before we answer, I just have a, I, I just have a technical issue. Oh, sure. Like I created a new layer I wanted to draw over and for some reason it doesn't do anything. Oh. Um, is the little eye icon turned off on that layer? 
Is that like have a, a line through it? I think I have a selection, like a pixel selection. Oh, there you go. Okay. Okay, cool. Okay. All right. Yeah, the chat's yeah. talking about Magma. And anybody watching that's not familiar with Magma Studio, um, you can definitely check it out by going to magmastudio.io. Uh, you can try it for free. And it is a really amazing cloud-based collaborative uh, drawing and painting app for artists. So you can connect with any other artist you know around the world and draw together on the same canvas. Oh, let's see. We had. A, I'm trying to remember the last question we were on. Oh, yeah, we were talking about posing characters. So, um, if any of you guys want to chime in on kind of what are your best practices or how do you think about posing characters when you're when you're designing? Well, I think a great exercise is to draw people from life. Mm -hmm. um, people are are constantly moving, and it forces you to to quickly. Uh, you know, find those uh, lines that are specific to that pose. And at first, that's something that probably won't work when you try it. But as you do it more often, uh, after a while, you'll find ways to find that one shape or that, that one gesture that really captures the, the pose that you see in front of you. So that is what I would really recommend doing mm -hmm. as an exercise. Just a small technical thing with the audio on the stream. If anyone is, if any of you guys are listening to the audio of our call come through on speakers on your desktop, if it's possible to re reduce the volume just a little bit, not so much that you can't hear it, but just a little bit, I think we're getting a little bit of um, echo coming through the mic. So is that from us, one of us? I, I, yeah, if, well, I was just gonna say, if any, any one of you are using speakers, if you're able to adjust the volume on the speakers down just a little bit, it sounds like it's coming out of speakers and then going into your microphone. Okay, that might be me, is that better now? Checking one, two, yeah, it sounds great. Okay. Yeah, that fixed. Awesome. Thank fixed you. It. That was fast. Anyone else has exercises for for character posing? Yeah, I think. I just think doing uh, pages and pages a small of, little. Oh. Sorry, ladies hey, first. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I was just saying, uh, doing gestures uh just like really really quick ones uh whether from memory or from sometimes i like watching a film and i'll just sketch what i see uh as they're moving um i don't try to pause it and the whole goal is just to really try to capture that that motion and that dynamism in in the movement so drawing from life is great but you can also uh do do studies um, with with film or, or television shows as well. Good one. Yeah, I think for me another way I practice on posing is I go on YouTube and I just find videos and I pause if I find interesting poses and then I just steady do quick gesture drawings from them. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, think, I heard it. Uh, Artists recommend once a uh, similar kind of thing as what you said, Kofi, except they uh, they would reference kung fu movies. Because kung fu oh. movies usually have super <laughs> dynamic poses, but they're real people, so you know it's like technically humanly possible. Mm -hmm. And also to do to do like super quick, uh, very cartoony poses in the beginning, like a stick figure that you just get sort of the essence of uh, how a body is posed. So you exaggerate a lot. So you have a mm -hmm. kind of like a much stronger pose than would be natural with a realistic person. That gives you a strong foundation to, uh, to build upon in a way. But just be like super exaggerate whatever you want to show. Oh, for those of you guys in the chat, um, 
who have commented that you're not able to see uh, Nikolai. That is because um, he's drawing on an iPad and it's a little bit harder for the iPad to pull double duty and share the camera as well. Um, so he, I can't remember, well, Nikolai's doing doing the um, the medicine man. So we'll just say that he's, he's deep in the shadows, you know, kind of behind <laughs> the scenes, speaking to us from, from the nether regions. Yeah. Um... I don't think I should show my face after this drawing is done. I think it's best for people don't know <laughs> oh my goodness. how I look or who I am. It's uh, gonna get dirty. <laughs> another, Nicolai. another. Oh, little, yeah, another little trick for gesture drawing with the hands is that uh, when you're drawing, somebody that's gonna use their hands in some way to draw the hands before the arms. Because the, the arms will always just automatically move how they need to move for your hand to be where it needs to be. So always draw, you draw the like the rough torso first, and then you draw wherever you need the hands. And then after that, you fill in the upper and lower arm and elbow, because you don't need to draw your way from the shoulder out to the arm, you know? It, it feels easier in a way to just draw floating hands in the beginning because that's how the body works anyway right it's your arms will just follow the instructions to to get the hand where it needs to be yeah i've had i had a figure drawing instructor who gave exactly the same advice nikolai um the other thing that really helped me not have my poses be as stiff was understanding how the anatomy moves and paying attention to like the secondary elements that move. So like if an arm needs to stretch way out or down or up, the shoulder also totally raises like the shoulder blade and, and, the, and the where the arm connects to the shoulder, like paying attention to, to those angles and to the waist and all of that really, really helped me make things look more dynamic. Yeah. You guys are moving fast. This is cool. <laughs> It's fun. And I don't know who who mentioned like drawing the hand before the arm, but like that's an observation I made when I I watch Kim Jong Gi drawing life. He would often mm. draw the the hand first and then move into add the rest of the arm. So yeah. Uh, technical question. Uh, I see so many layers, but there's no, I, I can't get access to my layers. Oh, if, if there's, if there's you, no arrow thing. If you um, hover over the layer that oh, was yeah, yours okay. that you're okay. access yeah. to and right click. No, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. I drew everything on one layer. I thought I was okay. I got to be I thought my rough was on a different layer, but it's all at the same time. Damn it. Ah. So I've got everything on one layer, including the rough. Ah. <laughs> that's, how, that's how you learn. I can't tell you how many times I was really deep into a piece and realized that I'd been painting on the wrong layer. No. For, for like, oh, for like no. 45 oh, minutes yeah. or an hour. <laughs> yeah, and it's sometimes my, also... It's my standard workflow. Yeah, there's <laughs> there's a, Sometimes like control, because I use a lot, like, yeah, like con control Z or uh, command Z, but then next to it is control E. And it's like, uh, it fusions the the two layers and sometimes I do it without noticing it and for a while. Yeah, so that happens. Oh. You need to get over to Procreate. Come over to the fun <laughs> side. I, <laughs> <laughs> I use it but only mm -hmm. not for work. Like I use it for a uh, personal sketching and because I need for when I work I need my Cintiq and I need the big screen. The uh, uh, iPad is too small for me. Hmm. I need to be seated properly and like with this at an angle. Yeah, yep. I guess it's also about what you're used to, right? It's I can understand that. 
Yeah. Nicola, I think really early on when Procreate was first coming out, you did you did some of the artwork that was in the um, like the examples that came with the app, right? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And so I re I remember when I was first considering getting an iPad. Um, I was in the store and I and I'd heard about Procreate and I opened it up and I went into the examples because I was like, I want to see what's possible with this. And um, uh -huh. the, I think you did one that was like a, a derelict spaceship that had crashed somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. that's a little bit more my uh, my wheelhouse. I saw that and I was like, oh, OK, I'm sold. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's cool. Yeah. Uh, so. So. So I realized like the problem I had uh, earlier was like another layer not responding. So that's why it got me confused. And that's why I, okay. I drew everything on the same layer. Uh, yeah, each of you should be know, able like, to start up as many layers as you need. Yeah, but then, so I created a new layer and for some reason I can't draw it. it just oh, that's strange. Which, which layer is it? Can you tell me the number of it? So, uh, layer two. So I'm seeing, yeah, I'm seeing a layer two and then a copy of layer two. Yeah, so the copy is where the line is, and I'm I'm trying to access to to draw on the layer two. Are you wanting to get to the copy or the original? The original. Okay, I'm going to try to assign you to that layer. Hang on, just a moment. Oh, hang on, I think the opacity is zero percent. Ah, oh. <laughs> all right, I feel super stupid now. <laughs> oh, did you get it? Yeah, it was the opacity was at zero. Percent. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so Don't worry, rough, I've done exactly the same thing before. <laughs> the part of my rough is there. Okay, I, I messed everything. So. I was uh, there was a few times where I opened up magma, and because I was still getting used to some of the shortcuts, I didn't realize that I had accidentally color picked the white background. And then I went to start drawing my layer. And I'm like, what's what's wrong? I'm checking the opacity. I'm checking everything else. And then I realized, oh, I'm just drawing with white ink on a white background. We've all been there. I think. <laughs> yeah. Also, also, if you made it like a tiny selection somewhere that you don't see. Oh, and you yes. keep drawing and nothing happens oh, because you have this pure yeah. selection somewhere. <laughs> Yes, totally. I've done that many times. Yeah, I like to use a lot of masking and selections and stuff in my workflow. And sometimes I'll be coming away from a selection and accidentally my, my stylist will just like bump into the canvas and make the teeniest little selection and then I can't figure out what's going on. Exactly. I have this uh, sort of this mental list I go through if, if nothing is working. It's like, is the layer alpha locked? Do I have a selection somewhere? <laughs> and I'm just trying. It's almost like that pre flight checklist. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. <laughs> That's awesome. Now, let's see. Uh, Walter and Slovan, you guys are, looks like you guys are kind of collaborating, or at least you're. you're it looks like Walter's character is helping yes, or, did. yeah. I didn't even notice. I, I'm, I'm, so, <laughs> like, I'm trying to sort out the story of my life. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> One is thinking so. up the other. <laughs> It, it looks like the young the younger hero is almost like um, like yeah all dreaming up or thinking up or conjuring uh, the wizard. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, a yeah. And then Kofi, you've got our you've got our sort of our young hero on the on the left side here. Yeah. 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 What, can you tell us anything about our hero? Because you looks like you've you've locked in your design pretty well. Yeah. Um... So since he's still a fledgling uh, wizard, he has a bag slung along his shoulder filled with like books um, that he's still studying from. And in the other hand, he has like his new uh, one that he's learning to use. And he, he has a special medallion that helps him to control his magical powers around his neck. Nice. Very cool. Where did he get the medallion from? 
Um, it was given to him uh, by his mother. It's a special heirloom in their mm. family. Very cool. Was his mother also magical? Exactly. He comes from uh -huh. a magical family. Awesome. Nice. And it looks like he's looking over at like the the uh, the big baddie over here on the right side, the the, the tyrant king. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, he looks small but brave. Yeah. And curious. <laughs> oh man. Hmm. When I was younger, all of my friends and I would get together and we would write like in a notebook and we would just make up stories, but in the round. So like one person would write a chapter and then the next person would write like a couple of paragraphs. So this is giving me vibes from, yeah. <laughs> from those days. It's, it's really fun. Um, I remember last year hosting a lot of these jam sessions like I had, because I do a lot of different the kind of things with art that's not just like straight up drawing and painting, um, which is so fun to do in Magma. But I remember like coming away from Lightbox last year after all of these jam sessions, like being inspired for months and months to just like get in there and just just draw. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and it's amazing the collaborative uh, capacity that this software has. Yes. You can draw with artists yeah. across the globe. And yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, it's like, I, you know, with the advent of things, like informationally, with the advent of things like YouTube and online courses, like suddenly access was democratized globally. But Magma is really cool. Just like you said, I think, Kofi, um, that like now you can actually interact with other artists. Um, exactly. And like I'm sitting here just learning, observing each of, each of your workflows and styles. Mm-hmm. It's amazing. Like, it, it makes me wonder how, if this technology existed uh, during the era of like some of my old art heroes, how they would like collaborate oh, and work <laughs> on amazing projects together. Yeah. <laughs> it's crazy how real time it feels as well. Like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's no. Lag. And I bet it feels like that for everybody. I don't know how they did that. I think they have like wizards and alchemists working on the project. <laughs> yeah. I drew this yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> That's how long your lag is. <laughs> it's like a 24 hour lag. That's I'm then impressed because you managed to figure out at what time to do it. <laughs> at what time yeah. to speak. Yes. And exactly where to click on the white screen yes. that gave you yes. no feedback at all. Exactly. You know? Walter's a time traveler. <laughs> if only. Oh, just a moment. I'm going to bump back over to the chat. Sorry, chat. I have several windows open. I'm going to jump back over here and see how our chat's doing. Oh, we've got a question um, that came in from Twitch. Uh, any tips from um, some of you guys about how to keep a design simple and good? In other words, not overcomplicating things. Mm. Keep it small. Mm. Mm -hmm. Keep your canvas small until you can't do anything more on that level. Keep it like the size of your iPhone screen. Uh, if it's an environment or if it's a character, uh, keep it thumbnail sized until you're uh, happy with it. Like stick to 15 minute uh, sketches on that level before you move on. Yeah, that's so helpful. And something I know that I don't do enough of uh, is solving problems at the thumbnail level. Yeah, because uh, I, I feel like the whole foundation is in the thumbnail. And if the th thumbnail isn't good, then there's no point in keep on 
pushing it, you know, so it's, it isn't working. If it doesn't have something within 15 minutes, then make a new one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of my um, instructors at Noman advised me, they just said, fail quickly, like develop a learning process where you don't take too long to realize that you need to learn or start it over or do the next one. Yeah. Uh, somebody commented in the chat of like, imagine if we could get a lot of the amazing classic painters in on something like magma. <laughs> yeah. exactly. And then if we could, if we could span time, like it'd be really cool to get like Rembrandt and then uh, Sargent on the same canvas painting and interacting together. Well, apparently yeah. I'm a time traveler, so I, I'll see what I can do. Can you go, can you go <laughs> can can you for us? ping those guys and see if, uh, they want to join you in 2021. I think Craig Mullins would love to be part of that canvas. Oh yeah, Craig yeah. was on uh, a couple of the drawing jams last year, and one of the yeah. coolest moments was uh, Craig and Sparth were on the same canvas, and they were like collaborating on like an environment sketch, like some kind of sci-fi environment sketch together. It was so cool to watch the two of them work together. Yeah. Actually, what's yeah, the name? I was of, actually of... on the same canvas. Oh, this cool. was, uh, yeah. What's the name Crazy. of the of the scientist who was in the wheelchair? Oh, Stephen Hawking. Yeah, Stephen Hawking. Yeah. He actually uh, wanted to know about if time travelers existed, and so he invited people to a party, people from the future to a party that he would organize yesterday. And, and then no one showed up. <laughs> no, that's so sad. <laughs> that's, I think that's like 100% creative and 100% scientific method. I love that. Absolutely. <laughs> that's interesting. Uh, one, uh, Walter, one of the things I loved about living in the Netherlands for the time that I did was the access that you have to, um, I mean, obviously in Amsterdam to the um, <clears throat> Rijksmuseum and then also uh, the Van Gogh Museum mm -hmm. to actually see the original paintings. Yeah. Um, but there's so much art in Holland, so many of the of the old masters. Yeah, yeah, that's really cool. It was I uh, what was it? I got to uh, take a tour of Rembrandt's house uh, oh, okay. in Amsterdam, and then uh, went up to you finally wind up on the top level where his studio was and where like a lot of his understudies were working. And uh, there was a collection of a lot of the actual objects that he used as reference, like the different mm -hmm. skulls and things. And looking at them next to the window, which was providing the, the natural lighting that he was using for observational painting, it was it just all clicked. <laughs> it just made wow. sense. It was like, oh, yeah. yeah, he was definitely painting here. That's cool. Yeah, I yeah. think it's, it's often when you when you see the references people use, Mm -hmm. Things look less special in a way. I don't mean that in uh, in a bad way, but mm -hmm. you, you can often see that you know they they didn't make anything up. It's it's not so outlandish. You know, it it really comes from where they live or what they know, or it's it's really uh, well researched in a way. Yeah, and I, I love for the same reason I love looking at the reference and the painting too, because you can see just how much of it is practiced observational skill, but then you can see where they observed and then incorporated their own design mm -hmm. in, in the final product. And it's really cool to kind of backwards engineer someone's process a little bit by observing those things. Yeah. Awesome. Everybody's at color. Mm -hmm. Everybody's either working in their flats or they're rendering. Well, okay, what's going on with the cat up here in the bubble? Well, as I mentioned, he doesn't control his powers yet, so he accidentally oh. placed a bubble around his head and around his cat as well. I love it. That's it's so nice this time. It's interesting on the last. Yeah, 
the the last jam uh, that I hosted yesterday, we had um, kind of we, animals and familiars start to find their way into the canvas and well as well. And uh, I think it was um, Carla Ortiz may have started it, but we had this very vicious chicken that started to kind of take over and appear everywhere. Vicious chicken. That's a, <laughs> that's a film I would love to see. Yes. The chicken was a little it's misunderstood. A film. I feel like the chicken was just defending itself from the chef that wanted to cook it. <laughs> vicious chicken. Isn't it in Rocky where one of his uh, things he has to do is to cap catch a chicken? You are so correct. Was that Rocky things? Four? I felt it in in I think it was Rocky Four when he was in Russia and he they just gave him like a farm to live on and train. He had to find all these yeah, natural think, ways to train. I think it was one of the first ones where it, it was this old guy. The, oh you know, the, yeah, is that that's something that Mick had him do? Mick exactly. Yeah. So he also did it then to his, uh, I think it's in also the new, the uh, Creed, the Creed movies. He also makes the young Creed uh, try to catch the chicken. So that could be like a new new part of that franchise. Vicious Chicken is like it gets bad. It's revenge. A spin-off. Um, yeah. <laughs> Well, you could say that the chicken actually wasn't just a device for training, but the chicken also learned some things too, working with Rocky. And that chicken exactly. went into the chicken fighting underworld and became a champion. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> and he knows all the weaknesses of Rocky now. Uh-oh. He's seen him in action. But what weight class would the chicken be in? I mean, we're talking like what, like two pounds? Featherweight. <laughs> Featherweight. <laughs> <laughs> Touche. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. Mm -hmm. it's so funny. Oh, uh, you guys in the chat, feel free to to type in some questions, and I can bring them forward to our artists. Somebody gave the featherweight joke a ten for ten score. <laughs> That's fairly good. <laughs> it's fun to okay. zoom out, like to look at the other ones here. I'm oh, yeah suddenly so much has happened you zoom in on your own thing and then you zoom out and like, wow <laughs> people are gotten busy i feel like cool. there's a metaphor for life in there somewhere <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes let's get existential <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all right so we've had a question come in from the chat about um any tips or best practices when either color picking or, or deciding on colors for like value and hue when you're building up a piece. I think it's a lot of um, skill to be learned in just picking your own colors, even though you use reference, like never pick it from the reference, pick it from the color picker yourself so you know exactly where it is. Yeah. I've learned a lot about what actual colors I'm looking at by going into the reference, color picking it, and then looking at where it is on the the hue wheel and realizing mm -hmm. like, oh, I thought I was looking at this color, but it's really that color. Yeah, and if you do that enough, like if you, if you pick the color you think it is and you paint and you see, oh no, that's not that at all. And you have to go in and adjust. That's when you learn a lot from it. It's a, uh, yeah. I learned a lot painting traditionally. I think when you have to mix the colors actually with, with paint, 
that yeah. really is a way to to learn really about you know what you need to do to achieve that certain mixture mm -hmm. so that, that would be yeah. my uh, my approach yeah and also like learning uh, simple color theory like um analogous colors um uh, yeah and like the simple color theory it really helps too. is there a simple color theory <laughs> sorry i mean uh, the, the, sorry i mean the fundamentals of color theory that's what i mean yeah <laughs> sorry <laughs> speaking of fundamentals we've got a question in the chat about there are so many different things you can focus on and um they were wondering you know like how do you approach how much time you spend on learning perspective and then lighting and then color and proportion i think you just have to I take think with perspective <laughs> sorry go ahead oh, yeah um i was just saying that all, all of them are important to learn but it can feel overwhelming trying to do everything at once. So maybe just tackle one subject at a time. Like if you really want to sit down and uh, challenge yourself to master perspective, then make that your goal for a month. And then you can switch to anatomy later, color theory after that, just like rotate it. So it doesn't seem like good overwhelming all at once. Yeah. That's really good advice. I think that really helps to take on one thing at a time. Yeah, the nice thing with perspective as well is that it's uh, once you learned it, you know it. It's it's kind of like a binary thing. It's different with anatomy where it's many sort of levels and layers of knowledge that you can choose to go through. But with perspective, it's kind of like once you understood it and the principles, then you then that's it, then you know it. It's uh, one of the few things that are it's kind of like math in a way, it's a bit <laughs> binary. I agree. And I, I think for me, one thing that really helped me to learn the fundamentals was when I started um, turning, applying my exercises to my own personal project. So like if I was trying to learn more dynamic um, poses, steady more dynamic mm. poses, I'd rather turn them into like uh, character designs for my IP, maybe for my volleyball IP. And then I'll mm -hmm. use that to steady dynamic poses. By the end of the day, I would have character designs of my volleyball players. Yeah. No, that's... That's smart to put the practice into the your own work as well. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, it really gives you the opportunity to to learn by doing it once and then doing it again. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that for me, it really helps to separate the intent of a piece that I'm working on. Like if I'm doing a piece strictly for learning. And I sometimes I have to release myself from the need for it to be perfect enough to be a portfolio piece or whatever. Like if I'm just straight up learning something, uh, just let it be what it is, and then and then learn what I can from it, and then move to the next one. Uh, we've got a question that came in: uh, Are there any suggestions on how to move from traditional painting and drawing to digital painting and drawing? Um, they understand the principles remain unchanged, but how much do the tools impact your work? It's cleaner. <laughs> very, very little cleanup to do. <laughs> it's just a, a different tool. Well, I but think the un undo button is a, is a very oh, important yes. mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, the being able to, to take back every decision is is a very helpful thing in in some instances but it, it can also be a curse because it it becomes harder to commit to the decisions you make 
and suddenly there is an endless amount of possibilities. So I think that's a, a, a thing to deal with when you make the transition. If you draw or paint traditionally, you really have to commit to the decisions you make uh, or you're, you'll be erasing uh, that also is possible, but paper can also only take a certain amount uh, of erasing. So I think that that is a, a big difference in workflow. Yeah. Yeah. yeah whenever I go to whenever I go to draw in my sketchbook and I notice my left hand twitching for the control the control Z, <laughs> then I know that sometimes maybe I need to spend a little bit more time in my sketchbook. <laughs> <laughs> That is, if, if if it's a problem for you. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, no, I, I can definitely see for myself personally where sometimes uh, in digital, when you can take back every decision, like you said, Walter, I, I can anyway get a little too scatterbrained um, and think of too many things at once, whereas when I go back to paper, it really forces me to slow down and think and make very deliberate marks. Mm. Yeah. That's a great point. But, but um, what I wanted to add is like, I, I I think like both of them are just tools. And what matters is your fundamentals. If you understand what you're doing, you can replicate what you do in digital traditionally and vice versa. Mm -hmm. And so it's like fundamentals is king. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Oh, there's a few people that have just joined us in the chat and they're curious to know what we're doing. So we have some fantastic artists who are designing characters together on the same canvas. Uh, they're using Magma. Um, it's, it's a web-based app at magmastudio.io and it allows artists from anywhere on the planet to collaborate on the same canvas in, in, a, in a tool that's very similar to Photoshop uh, for drawing and painting. And so uh, right now we are designing characters that all kind of exist in the same story. And um, we have on the right hand side, we have uh, Kristen working on sort of an, an evil king or maybe at least a misunderstood king. <laughs> <laughs> King's motives. Um, and then we have uh, Nikolai working on sort of a, a, a medicine man, witch doctor type person up, up in the, the upper right. And then moving into the middle, I correct me if I'm wrong, guys. I believe we had kind of a collaboration <laughs> between um, between Walter um, and uh, Sylvain yes. on yeah on this this young character that's sort of conjuring things, putting putting cats and 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 uh, mice in bubbles accidentally, and kind of learning his skills. Um, and then Kofi is working on uh, sort of our young wizard and training hero down on the yeah. left hand side. <laughs> yeah, I, I, Kofi, your character feels to me like they could either be in an animated feature or actually a video game, just because of how thoughtfully you've laid out their inventory. Like, I can see all the stuff they have. <laughs> I'm expecting an interface with, like, I can cycle between whether I'm going after consumables or... <laughs> <laughs> this is awesome. All right, Kristen, so your, your king has evolved quite a bit. Um, oh. And, and he, oh yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> I didn't mean to startle you. <laughs> no, your your kings come quite a long way, and uh, I was wondering if you had any more ideas that you had uh, or or developments that you want to share about your character. Oh gosh, um, <laughs> yeah. I think I think he. I, I like what you said about him being a, a misunderstood king. So mm. I, I'm sure he has a very tragic backstory where mm. maybe there was a point where he was a good and just ruler but then something mm. happened he made a decision that totally messed everything up but he's too prideful maybe pride is his ultimate uh, uh downfall and mm. and he made a decision not to irrigate the land and that's what caused the drought because there's no more water and he refuses oh, wow. to admit it and he refuses to accept help. And now there's gonna be an uprising and everyone's gonna turn against him. And maybe the stories from his point of view 
and, and just like Marie Antoinette just showing the whole like destruction, fall from grace. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. I feel like he should have a really tall, cool glass of water next to him. Like oh, I still live in luxury. <laughs> that's a good um, idea. Uh, but I love that. My, my, some of my favorite villains are the ones that they develop their characters enough that you can go, hey, you know what? I feel like I can sympathize with them a little bit. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. That's that's how I think I felt about uh, Thanos. Mm, um, yeah. Avengers. Yeah. Yeah, I really like the I liked his character in in those films. Mm -hmm. And he moved in between some of the different archetypes. Like there was philosopher Thanos, and there was warrior Thanos, and you know ruler mm -hmm. Thanos. No. It, it kind of sends in what it says. It's just the. Ha, have you seen the What If series? Oh yeah, really good stuff. It's, I haven't seen the latest one, so no spoilers. But okay, <laughs> yeah, it's he, he's sort of he's sort of back with at least the Black Panther episode, where mm. Black Panther. What if uh, Black Panther was uh, Star Lord or? Oh yeah. <laughs> And then uh, you have uh, a lot of fun Thanos stuff there. Mm -hmm. uh, what I love about that too is they didn't just take the character of Black Panther and just insert him into that role. Because the person was different, it changed the nature of who Star-Lord is. Um, and yeah. I thought that was really interesting. Like he was he was famous instead of like nobody knew who he was. Like people actually knew who he was. Yeah. It's like a great guy that everybody loves. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, I gotta I gotta give some props to uh, Stefan Frank, um, who is the uh, animation supervisor for that show. Um, he's he has pulled together an amazing team. I just love what they've done with that series. Yeah. And also the style, like I, I love the the two D style on all the backgrounds and stuff. I love mm -hmm. that. Yeah. And we're seeing some really. Oh, go ahead. No, I just think that one of the greatest things that has happened to animation in the in the latter years are into the Spider Verse and Klaus. Oh, These two yes, movies yes. Has just sort of, yeah. you know, showed yeah. us that there there's so much new cool places to go with also both three D and traditional animation. Um, yeah, so it's nice to see that they they still use the very 2d looking background in what if but even though the characters are very 3d so yeah, i just really like that well and I, the, the, yeah and productions like those that have been really pioneering i love how they're just all they're doing is just taking the best of any tool that's available and using it to serve to serve the aesthetic they're going for the art that they're trying to make no yeah. and then you have Artists like Alberto Mielgo that it's like shows how to use it in the best way or cool design and mm. yeah. Have you seen his stuff on uh, like the his the Witness the short movie? It's mm. part of it's on Netflix. Part yes. of the Love, Love Death, Death and Robots. Robots. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And he also did. Uh, a trailer for Watch Dogs, um, uh, uh, computer game, and I yeah, just loved uh, his style, mm -hmm. both both in design and animation, and yeah, Alberto Mielgo, his crazy good. I think that's one of the things that I love about all of the streaming that's happening right now, is it's because you don't have shows that are competing for this the same time slot, like how we mm -hmm. used to watch television in the eighties. Um, now it's just, there's a multiplicity of amazing content and it's giving, I feel, bringing more voices to the table, more different kinds of expressions and people can make, can take more risk with a project because it's not the one be all end all uh, for that network. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. And also more focus on animation, I feel. It's mm. been lately also with the 
manga stuff and mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. it's cool okay all right so we've got another uh design related question that came in on the chat any advice on clothing design how do you choose clothing elements that are realistic to what the character would want to wear but also looks uniquely good anybody want to take a stab at that one hmm. i think it's just knowing who your character is personality wise and then also being really clear on um time period because mm -hmm. that way you can check out so much like fashion from that era and you can also look into I, I think there's a difference between looking at like fashion magazines from a pr particular era or or fashion illustrations and then looking at uh what the common people wore because there's going to be a disparity there and from that point you can decide whether or not you want to heighten or exaggerate elements or or play things down depending on the tone of the story you're creating yeah that's great advice Mm. I've definitely just found a lot of help. I mean, it sounds like the obvious answer, but a lot of help in reference. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You know, I might be doing a, a medieval tunic, and I know what a medieval tunic looks like, but if I'm willing to take the time to go search, I might find tunics that were done in a different way than what I'm already familiar with. And it helps me push out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I think that looking for references is a good start on almost anything, you know, just to not take it. Like, I feel like your your brain is a library and mm. you uh, the, the longer you paint or the more you paint, the bigger the library gets, but in order to put in new books, you need to paint from new references. And then once you use those references, that's when you kind of read the books, but you need to put them in there. Like you need some fresh stuff in there. Mm -hmm. oh, true. Nikolai, can you tell us a little bit more about your, uh, your medicine man up here? Yeah, well, <laughs> no. I mean, there's a, he's doing some cool stuff. Yeah, I. He's a guy you didn't want as a babysitter, basically. Like, the... <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to have to use that in a pitch somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Do not use this man as your business. That's basically <laughs> all I want to say. That's on his business card, right? That's like <laughs> not for yeah. babysitting. Yeah. Also, I guess don't don't let him uh, don't let him watch your your pets either because he's got some interesting exactly. things happening there. Yeah. Oh, man. He will make you drink your pet after. Can any? Do you question. have any ideas on who he's working for right now, or is he up to his own his own tricks? Yeah, he has. I think he's very uh, like productive. Like he's he just gets into his own things and uh, yeah, living in his own world. I think, mm -hmm. and only now and then he gets visits from people that need his help. But I think it's safe to say that. He never get the same visitor twice. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh, that's very ominous. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Either he's that good at what he does, they don't need anything else, or there's or... some other reason. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that's the thing. <laughs> Technical <laughs> question, like uh, voucher. I see you can draw on someone else's layers. Uh, how does that work? Because I'm trying to move my layers around to go. Oh, I'm still on my own layer. But it's just uh, higher than 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 the one I'm drawing. Uh, so because I, I've been trying to draw over, but then every I go <laughs> under everything, mm. so it's it's locked, right? Oh, you we can you a... can you can pick them up and move them. 
exactly. Yeah, you can move your yeah, layers. But I've been doing it, but then it, it comes back to every where, like every time it, it goes back to where I am on the layers. Hmm. So oh, okay. But back. in the layer stack, so it, it, did you try to lift seems, it in the layers? It seems stack? we have a, like a spot in the layers, and we can't move them around. Like I, I can't move a layer above, let's say, Christine drawing. Mm. Like I do it, and then it's whenever a... I draw on it, it goes. <laughs> it uh, which which layer are you trying to move? Maybe let me see if I can like do something. Twenty-three. No, but that, it seems it works now. Are you using the it's arrows it's... to move them up? Yeah, yeah. I, I, no, but it seems to be working now. Okay. Oh, okay. For some reason, it's as if it was a uh, like um, like stuck to where I am in the in the layer stack. Hmm. So did you say that you're able to get it to do what you want now? Yeah, it seems like yeah. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. All right, the king looks like he has an advisor now. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's oh, so <yeah>. cute. <laughs> 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 Just giving oh, the worst no. advice. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I wonder if the real villain here is the little mouse. Maybe the king's just oh. being controlled. That's so cool. Lore is deep. Yeah. <laughs> the lore is getting really deep, guys. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think that's one of the things that's been so fun about these sessions is you get a bunch of artists together, especially artists that are needing to think and design for story. And you can't help but get a really cool story just evolve. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> Where did my babysitter take them? <laughs> my eyes, oh no. <laughs> and the, the babysitter's like, don't bother me, kid. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh. This is amazing. I love this it. This is so fun. <laughs> yeah, it's so fun. <laughs> oh, this little black cat underneath the medicine man. <laughs> Let's see, we've had a, an interesting question come in from, from uh, Twitch. Um, they're asking, how do each of you approach uh, a character brief for your project? Um, in other words, you get your brief from your art director or whomever, um, and then what are your favorite places to go find references? Does anybody well, I guess the have boring a... answer is uh, Google. <laughs> and Just to Google that stuff. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. Depends on the story. Mm. And I think when it comes to Google, a lot of it is, at least for me, has been learning how to search in Google, how to be more specific, mm. what to ask for. Yeah. But, uh... and, I also, and even... like, every time oh, sorry. I... No, sorry. I Every time I gather uh, references to make... Uh like a mood board or like it gathers i i always save them so i have this big library of references that mm -hmm. collected over time so i always go through that first to kind of put the relevant stuff into one folder for the new uh work and then if i feel i'm missing something then i go and search yeah i i do the same thing with um Pure Ref. I don't know if any of you guys are using Pure Ref, but mm. I can just create yeah, a master cool. canvas of all my references for that project and then save the entire Pure Ref canvas and the the images that are attached to it. And then for me anyway, it becomes, it becomes a lot easier to reference them because somehow emotionally I'll remember a, if a particular character or project, I know that I have those kinds of references in there and then I can go hunt it down. Yeah. I agree. 
you mentioned it's important how to search in Google. What what is your way of searching in Google? Um, it's not. It's less of a technical thing, but more like developing my vocabulary for things. So like if I if I have need to find references of pine trees, for example, or even just trees. Uh, maybe I don't know a lot about trees, but the more I search for trees, the more I learn about them. And as soon as I find that one image that looks closer to what I'm looking for, I'll go to the web page and try to find out what that specifically is. And I'll search for more things of that specific tree name, um, just by way of example. So helping yourself to move from general to more specific once you find the shape language you're looking for or the type of reference. And then the other one is uh, using tools in Google Im image search. You can, if you're needing something that's higher resolution, uh, you can tell your tools in Google image search to show the largest um, resolution images first at the top of the list. Mm. So those are kind of two things that I do. Yeah. Hmm. Sounds smart. It's more <laughs> just things born out of survival. <laughs> yeah. I, I realize how little I know about something when I start to go search for it because I don't know what to call things. <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's true. I, I'm terrible at writing stuff correctly, especially in English. Um, so it's a f figuring out how do I spell this first and then oh, there yeah. might be more luck. Yeah, I, I can sympathize a little bit um, from having learned two other languages and live outside of the US for so long. My English spelling has suffered because I sometimes want to spell it phonetically like you would in Norwegian. And then other times I'm substituting a, a, a V for an F or something like that from from a, a having to spell uh, in Dutch. So it's it all kind of blends together. Yeah. I think one of the coolest things about learning uh, Norwegian, Nikolai, is some of the movies that I go back and watch that are set yeah. in more of a like Viking time, like films like The 13th Warrior and stuff like that. I'll go back yeah. and watch those movies and I'll actually be able to understand some of what they're having <laughs> the Vikings say because they're yeah. kind of, they typically will like kind of blend together some, some Norwegian and some, uh, some Icelandic and that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's true, that's true. It's fun to hear American actors try to speak Norwegian in some films, you know, to kind oh, of mimic yeah. it. And they, you even had the, going back to Marvel, you had Loki uh, in his uh, in his own TV show now singing the whole song in Norwegian. Yeah, <laughs> that was so cool. Yeah. It's like, wow. I remember that. Fun. It's well, and the like, just to go down that rabbit trail just a little bit further with you, um, one of the coolest experiences I had while I was living in Norway was starting to pay attention to uh, Norwegian and Scandinavian uh, fairy tales. Because oh, yeah. there's a whole other genre of folk stories and fairy tales, like uh, Espinoskilad and, you know, a lot of the... Yeah. The, the troll mythology that we have now comes from a lot of those stories, but I took a really deep dive into reading a lot of those stories and there's so many cool ideas there. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's a lot of crazy stuff there. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of stories was made to keep your children away from running out in the forest, for example, like, uh, yes, it's so many. Also, uh, I love like the uh, German Christmas stories. Like you have, my wife is German. So I, was, I also love Germany and we're there like every other year. Mm -hmm. And uh, I kind of like the dark stuff when you, yeah. when the Christmas, like it's St. Nicholas that comes, right? He's the Santa Claus in a way. But he also has a partner who's called Knecht Rubrecht, and he's basically the devil. Like he wow. he brings a bag, and if you if you've been bad, like uh, you've heard that you don't get any gifts if you've been a, a, a bad child, you know, before Christmas. But mm -hmm. 
If you've been bad with Knecht Rubrecht knows, he will bring you with him in his dark bag. So it's basically Satan with a bag tagging oh, along with Santa Claus. <laughs> so either you've been good and you're safe or you haven't and you'll be just dragged away in a bag. So kidnapped. So man. Yeah. <laughs> this nice story. So <laughs> No, the, I, I agree. I think there's a lot of practical purposes that those those old stories served. Yeah, and it's interesting. You know, it's just uh, I also heard uh, another story from from uh, uh, Germany where it's it's not the Santa Claus that comes with gifts. It's the baby Jesus. It's the Christkind, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you're not supposed to see that the gifts are being put under the tree. That's Chris Kint that does that. So the children were told that if you look through the keyhole into the room and and try to see who puts the gifts under the tree, uh, uh -huh. baby Jesus will blow the light out of your eyes. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> wow. And it's just so yeah. dark. <laughs> Super harsh. <laughs> yeah, wow. <it's> just... <laughs> Horror I have I have no comment to that. <laughs> no, it's, <laughs> and that's what you tell a, a, a child that's just curious what it gets for Christmas. You know, it's just uh, fantastic. Well, in, in the Netherlands, we have a, a tradition quite similar to the one you you mentioned before, but it, it's yeah. also Santa Claus. But instead, it's it's black slaves who help them uh, and put the kids in the in the bag but it's it's really horrible and it, it it's uh, at this point every year there are protests for people who realize this is something that comes from a time that we should have been uh, you know we should know better by now uh, yeah. but there's so, so many people still want to hold on to to this tradition which personally I don't understand but this is a uh, the time we live in, I guess. Yeah. Hmm. I've got a follow-up question from the chat on the reference conversation. Someone's wanting to know how are there any tips on how much reference is too much reference? I think Masai Seki is also chiming in on that question too. Like, how do you find that balance of like not spending too much time gathering too much reference and just knowing what you need? Anybody have any insights there? For me, I, it's the I deadline. Think... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah, but that's very relevant, I think. Like, if mm -hmm. you have two days to make a great concept or a co concept drawing or a character drawing, I would spend maybe maximum one or two hours looking for good reference and then mm -hmm. uh, get started. Well, and to your point, Nicola, I think you're the one that mentioned it. The more reference you gather, the more the bigger your library gets. So uh -huh. yeah. sometimes you don't have to spend as much time because you've already got the reference. Yeah. So true. But yeah, I know many a time I've gotten caught in a rabbit hole on Pinterest. Going, going further and further and further, and then suddenly I realize, wait a minute, I'm not even looking at things that are relevant to my project right now. <laughs> yeah. so true. Suddenly it's the next day. <laughs> what the hell am I doing? <laughs> what happened? I haven't eaten in 17 hours. No. Now we're now we're we come full circle back to the time travel conversation. Yeah. So now we know how Walter does it. He time travels through Pinterest. <laughs> yes, yeah. that's it. But um, I wanted to on the reference issue. I wanted to chime in a bit. Like for me, the way I view it is like sometimes when um going through social media, I see like articles, images, videos that spark interest. So I'm always actively bookmarking uh, like different ideas that I see online on Instagram, mm. Twitter, etc. And sometimes a project comes through where that specific image or reference I've seen is the right thing that I need at the moment to help me spark mm -hmm. an idea. 
Yeah, so that's one way I build up like re a reference. Almost like a, a set of bookmarks that you know if you go straight to that place. Yeah, exactly. No, I have a similar thing with a, I think it's a French company that makes um, very period accurate um, medieval armor and tunics and costume and all those kinds of things. I think mm -hmm. it's called something like Arm Street Armor. Um, but I've got that bookmarked because I know that when I go there, I'm going to be able to find a ton of, you know, leather gauntlets and tunics and all kinds of things that I couldn't think of by myself. Mm -hmm. Well, we're in the home stretch, guys. We've got about another six or seven minutes to go. Um, no pressure, no deadlines. <laughs> um, because everything Sounds looks like so a deadline to me. Beautiful already. <laughs> you know, I think you guys, you guys crossed the finish line a little while ago because these are just looking amazing. <laughs> I only gathered the uh, reference so far. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you can just uh, give us a link to your Pinterest board and I'll yeah. put that up on the screen. <laughs> yes. I, uh, a conversation came up um, with Casey Kuo on one of the other uh, jams that we did. And that was, um, I had a great opportunity with some of my art friends and other people out there who are working gave me the opportunity to raid some of their Pinterest boards. Um, they're like, oh yeah, come in, check out my board, see the kind of reference I'm finding. And it was great because, you know, obviously you found a lot of the same things, but I think a different person has a different thought process and you find things that you, you never saw um, in someone else's reference library. So share away, Nikolai, go ahead and put that that 24 hour Pinterest board up on the, on the screen. <laughs> Yeah, I wish I had. Like I, I like Pinterest, but I don't use it because it's. Uh, you can't you can't zoom in and like it's. It's been a while since I used it, but it's a couple of things that I didn't like it. Um, I usually put several images in, in the same picture in a way, like in the, yeah. like a gather. And uh, I have this little app called Diptych. That's mm. where you can put in up to nine images in the same and adjust the size and zoom in. And yeah, so I I usually make gathers of nine different images and I just save these. Yeah. Oh, that's really cool. And that's an app pretty... that you're using on the iPad for reference? Yeah. Oh, or great. Just to yeah. make these. Uh, um, uh, mood boards. Yeah. No, that's the one because uh, I do some of my work on my iPad, and I've had trouble figuring out a good a good tool for reference. Yeah. No, oh, Diptych is uh, is great. It's awesome. Uh, yeah. I think another tool, if you are looking for um, an app for re reference boards on mm -hmm. iPad, is it's called Visref. It's really good. Uh -huh. Yeah. This ref, okay. Yeah. I think when I mentioned like the 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 last few minutes, I watched everybody's uh, um, styluses start moving quicker. <laughs> Everybody suddenly sped up. <laughs> yeah. This is great. I love the story that's evolved around this king over here, uh, with yeah. with the mouse and and the raven. It's so cool. I love it. <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. Now you guys will definitely be able to, if you go up to file and click save, it'll automatically download a flat PNG into wherever your downloads folder is on your computer. But I, if you have access to the Pro brushes, there's a chance, I don't know, that if you click on File, you can also export a, P, a, a PSD if you want to export the layers and stuff. Oh. Nice. You guys are getting a lot of love from the chat saying thank you and beautiful work. I think it's been an inspiring time for for everybody who's been looking in on this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, it's been a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, Lightbox has really become a, a highlight of the year for me. Because it feels like all of my friends and the artists that I follow on like social media, when Lightbox time comes around, like everybody just like 
starts posting and talking and sharing and it's really wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. I just I look forward to seeing everybody in real life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Definitely. The next yeah. one. Yeah. And I'm very fortunate to live literally like 10 minutes from the live box venue. I live in Pasadena, California. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I can't wait to have a box in my backyard again. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And um, for me, it's like, it's really crazy because I follow most of you like guys on Instagram and on Twitter. And even like for Walt, I took your character design course. So it's, Crazy to be drawing with you on the same board. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. It's my pleasure. Uh, I love that about the art community, though. Like, everybody's yeah. so friendly, and things light like box, like, kind of just creates all this access, I think, for artists to find each other. It's been so cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you're, you're never fully developed as an artist too so it's mm. the hunger to learn more is always there mm -hmm. so it's so cool to find a new artist to be inspired by or uh watch tutorials from or you know it's yeah, yeah it's so nice well i have had the magma canvas full screen on my other monitor my cintiq the whole time right in front of me so it's literally looked like um, five ghosts are drawing on my Cintiq, <laughs> creating all of this cool stuff. Um, but uh, guys, I want to thank all of you for your for your time on the jam today. Thank you for the knowledge you shared, um, for all of the fun that we had. Um, but I want to also be respectful of your time, and we are we're at twelve thirty, um, so I'm going to be closing out the stream. The Magma canvas will stay open. So if any of you want to stick around and, and finish something up or, or save it or whatnot, that'll still be available to each of you. But um, uh, yeah, I mean, um, Sylvain, uh, Kofi, uh, uh, Walter, Kristen, and uh, Nikolai, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, yeah, thank you so much. Us. This is awesome. Yeah. All right. This is, yeah, that was fun. Yes. And um, yeah, continue to have an awesome time at Lightbox. And for everybody You're watching, um, get out there and find out uh, everything that's happening on Lightbox. If you are watching and you don't know what Lightbox is, go to lightboxexpo.com. Um, you can still join in. Tickets are literally only $2. And you get access to a lot of really incredible talks and demonstrations, portfolio reviews, you name it. Um, definitely want to check it out. We will be back on this stream for our next um, drawing jam which will be a creature sketch session um, with Bryn Matheny, Terrell Whitlatch, Jason Chan, Wes Burt. Awesome. Uh, Walter, you're going to be back with us, I think, on that one? Yes. That's Is that right? right? Awesome. We'll have Alex Gonstad, uh, Lin Chen, uh, Steph Lebris, and Sun Min In. Uh, so that's going to be an awesome time, a really big group of, of cool artists. We're going to be making some creatures. Uh, so we'll see you for that if you want to come back and join us at 1.30 p.m. today, Pacific time. That'll be in one hour. Um, but in the meantime, everybody, continue to stay safe. Connect with as many people as you can at Lightbox and have a wonderful time. And uh, we'll see you back here again soon. Goodbye, everybody. Bye. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. <laughs>